Great. Thank you all for coming. So we're going to start. We're just going to be kind of a whirlwind tour because we have a lot of slides. And when I create a slide, I fall in love with it. I can't get rid of it. So you have to bear with me. Tide mills have largely disappeared from the North American coast. We are lucky that we have a couple in the Boston area, at least the buildings. We have one in Revere and one in Quincy. So we'll look at those today as the bookends of our, our geographical range from Revere to Quincy. But we have all of those waterways in between, uh, that the Charles River, the Mystic River, uh, and other parts of Boston Harbor that we need to look at for evidence of tide mills. Now, there are two tide mills in North America that still have their machinery, their equipment inside. One is in Long Island and one is in Virginia. So we're not lucky enough to have a mill here with all its equipment, but we do have two buildings. Most of the mills, all of them, I guess, in the Boston area have been covered over as Boston made more land for people to live on, to create commercial space, to, to create highways and playgrounds. And so the current shore of most of our waterways goes much farther out than it used to. And so our tide mill sites are now hidden way away from the coastline and underground. And lots of artifacts probably exist underground in the mud under our buildings and our other developments. But only at Revere and Quincy can we see some of those artifacts actually in the mud. So we'll take a look at a couple of photographs. But at the end, we'll talk about why this all happened just for a moment. So what is the type? Now, we all know, we all have a picture in our minds of river mills, right? They sit on the bank of a river, usually at a place where the uh, topography changes height so that you can create a mill pond on one side of the, the mill and then on the other you can let out water uh, from the mill into the descending stream. But think about a tide mill located right at the shore. It has to wait until the tide goes down before it can operate. So whether the water inside the dam is salt water or fresh water, it still cannot operate until the tide recedes enough so that it doesn't impede the action <coughs> or rotation of the mill wheel. So that is really the definition of a tide mill, one that sits here uh, at the coast. And so the, one of the concerns of a tidal mill is the tidal range. So you have to make your mill such that you can dam it at high tide, dam the water at high tide, and then let it out when the tide is lower. So you need to calibrate how your mill wheel will fit within that tidal range. So here we have an example of the tide just coming in. So across the middle we have a dam, and on the far side of the dam we have a mill. And the wheel is inside the mill in this case. And there's a little opening that can be opened so that the water can flow outside from the dam toward the outside, which is the far side, the seaside. When the tide is rising, it comes through the sea hatches, which are here on the lower right. Sea hatches, or tide gates, as they're called. <clears throat> and it, because they're just flat gates, the water will just come in until the tide has risen fully. And we have high tide, where the tide on the outside is at the same level as the tide on the inside of the dam. But then as the tide recedes, the miller can open the uh, sluiceway under the mill to let that water power the wheel. In the meantime, the flap gates down on the right have closed because now the pressure of the water inside the dam has pushed them closed. The, tide, the water wants to escape. It starts to go around those gates and then pushes them too. So now the water can't get out except when the miller lets it out through the mill. Here's another illustration of a similar thing. 
the tide is rising. You can see a flap gate there on the inside. The dam is on the left. And you can see that gate is open because the tide is rising and pushing it open and filling the, the mill dam just as well as it's rising on the outside. Here, we have after high tide. So it's, the tide has gone down just a little bit on the outside of that large gate. And uh, we have to wait. We can't mill because the wheel at the bottom of that illustration <coughs> can't move. In this case, we have a horizontal wheel with little bla blades around it, and that water will push that around, rotating that shaft. And then in the, up, the work it's doing in this case is milling grain for flour. And you see that we have a stationary yellow bedstone at the top of the illustration. And on top of that, we have a movable upper stone. So the shaft connects to that upper stone and makes it move around, uh, grinding the grain against the bottom stone. And that little funny thing at the top is just the hopper where the grain goes in to <coughs> shape into the stones. And here, we show an illustration of where the tide has finally fallen. And now that water can be directed toward the, the wheel, the water wheel, which will turn the shaft. So a tide mill requires a dam, right? Got to have some water. We'll see an exception to that. Dams require gates. So we have gates like barn gates. We saw a flap gate a moment ago, but these are like barn gates. So the water, we're on the ocean side in this illustration. The water's flowing through into the mill pond beyond. Here, the tide has fallen a little bit on our side. So the mill pond water has pushed those gates closed. And so we still have a full mill pond with the tide receding. Here's a flap gate, another example of that. Uh, this is a lift gate. So this wouldn't work automatically, but would need a superstructure to, to be operated to bring it up and down. <clears throat> so the miller would have to be attentive in this case. And wheels, lots of water wheels. We're familiar with them on the banks of, of rivers and streams. Uh, so the top, these two are just yeah, river wheels, uh, mill wheels, and the water comes over the top, and in the top case, the, the <coughs> wheel goes uh, clockwise. Oh, in the bottom of the station, it's pitched back, so the water's hitting the backside, and now it goes counterclockwise. And these are breast wheels where the, the water hits the wheel near middle, so at the top, it's like uh, just below middle, the middle one is at right at middle, and the bottom one is just above middle. But we believe that tide mills were operated with undershot wheels or with the horizontal wheel that we saw earlier. So here, the water uh, wheel <coughs> right at the bottom, so that wheel go around to power the mill. Remember, we have got the tidal range to think about in terms of where we position our, uh, our wheel in relation to the ebb tide. Here's an example of a horizontal wheel from Spain. It was made of stone. Most of ours in America were made of wood. This is a medieval illustration. But you can see how the water is directed by this uh, flume or penstock, so-called, toward the blades or paddles of the mill wheel to make it turn. Thematic illustration, you can see the, the mill pond on the right and that plume or penstock going down here toward the horizontal wheel, making that wheel turn again to grind grain for flour. Eventually, the horizontal wheel gets put inside a tub, uh, so it looks like a cylinder with a wheel inside. And eventually, that leads to the invention of the turbine at a much later date. Here's a tub wheel, not for use in flour milling, but for use in other work. And so you see a system of gears to transfer that power to other uses. It could be a sawmill. It could be um, a, a fulling mill, where uh, wool is pounded uh, by machine to make it pliable for, for use in textiles. So we're looking at the area from um, Revere, which was once North Chelsea, 
down to Quincy. So the waterways that connect to Boston Harbor. We're going to start at the north. So at North Chelsea, we see, I don't know if you can see that red ring here. It's the water <coughs> of a mill that became Slade's Spice Mill. So originally begun at the end of the, the 18th century, this mill, I'm sorry, the, near the first quarter of the, the 18th century, this mill eventually got into the hands of Henry Slade, and he uh, decided that, first of all, that his alternative product, besides just uh, flour, would be snuff. So he was grinding snuff. His kids, David and Levi, took over the business, or before they took over the business, they thought, well, let's uh, grind <coughs> spices. Because up until that time, spices were sold whole, and the homeowner would need to grind them, him or herself. And uh, of course, there weren't neat little packages. The amounts were not quite what you needed. You either bought too much or too little, and so on. So they, they you know, in, in their packaging, they also created the, the convenient <coughs> size. So that's one of the reasons the mill prospered. It exists there at the 770 Revere Beach Parkway. It's the one that in our initial tide, uh, title illustration, but here as well. It's a residential building now. The tide still flows underneath. Slade Spice Mill and in the black and white illustration, here's that initial slide that was on the screen. It's, I think, a combination of a photograph and, a, and some sort of painting technique to create this uh, nearly real illustration. <laughs> there was a book written, The Spice Mill on the Marsh, uh, which distilled a number of the sources that uh, we all have used from historical works. Uh, in our investigations into tide mills, we find that town histories often don't distinguish tide mills. <coughs> they talk about where the mills were located, but they don't tell you it's a tide mill. They didn't need to. They knew. They, they knew until the 20th century when we started forgetting that there were such things as tide mills. So oftentimes, it's a combination of map research uh, looking into those likely areas where tide mills could have existed and finding where they were located and then going back to the, the historical research, the documentation, to see if we can match that up and ensure that it was indeed a tide mill. Slade's you know, was very active right into the 20th century, though early after this advertisement in 1916, they did switch over to electric power. So in the mud, in Revere, you can still see artifacts from the mill. I'm not suggesting you go up there and dig any up, but just so you know that the possibility is there that an archaeologist could do an investigation and discover the secrets we don't know about. And there's the mill wheel, still there, the horizontal wheel. Um, so hopefully someone will save it before it disappears <laughs> from the action of the tide, you know, freezing weather and so on. So the next uh, illustration we have is this one that includes Deer Island. So Deer Island was never part of Revere, or I mean of <coughs> but Winthrop apparently was. And the gut between uh, Winthrop and Deer Island was called Shirley's Gut. And there was once a um, boat mill proposed for that location. So here we don't need a dam. A boat mill is tethered to the, to the coast and has wheels on the side. Possibly one would operate in, when the tide is going in one direction, the other would operate when the tide was going in the other direction. The only illustration I have is from China in the 1930s, <laughs> where you can see a boat mill. In this case, they have made a kind of little dam to perhaps focus the water pressure a little bit to, to make that stream go where they want it to in relations. But so the milling goes on in the boat and the wheels turn on its side. A different system of asset management, no longer, no longer a, a dam, but you have a boat. So when we get to East Boston in 1693, we see this map and 
within that circle, there's this legend that says De Moulin, so two mills. And we know they have to be tidal, right? Because <laughs> there was no elevation there. And here we go, we see the mill pond, the mill dam in 1801. Uh, and you see that channel leading downward, sort of toward Boston, I guess it would be, this, this channel here was how the water would have gotten in and out, possibly. Uh, we see a later proposal for a dam over here. Our original dam is in here. And way out here, we have a, a proposal. Never came to fruition. Of course, all that land did get filled in and extended beyond even what we see here because the airport's out there. But uh, this proposal thought that they could create a 1,000-foot-long channel here. Uh, 180 feet wide, and have mills on either side. So it was the East Boston Water Power Company that was proposed, never came to fruition. Here's a close-up of that so you can see a little better where the, uh, the mills would be way out at that extension. <clears throat> We're going to go up the Mystic River next, and the Mystic River was tidal all the way up to the Mystic Lake. The, a a mid-19th century investigation of the Mystic River discovered that there was salt water just inside the Mystic Lake, the lower lobe, if you will, of Mystic Lake. And so we know the tide reached that far. So we have three sites here in Medford, one just inside at the bottom, um, just inside the town line. And we can see that mill here, the Cutter Mill, so-called, at the time of the map. And the mill pond was the marsh behind it. But in order to make that more efficient, instead of creating a real pond, they created a dike through the marsh so that as the water receded, the tide receded, um, both fresh water and salt water would come down that dike and uh, power the mill. So, of course, the tide has to get low enough so that they can use it, but that, that water is coming out of that uh, spongy marsh and also from that dike, which would include fresh water <clears throat> as well as the receding tide from up here coming down into the dike. In the middle at, at Medford Square, I think it's called, there was a pond here and um, was long operating from the late 18th century, uh, yeah, 18th century, long into the 19th century. Many of these were not just grist mills, but had turned to uh, lumber or uh, Finnish lumber, perhaps, or mahogany, and like brackets for houses or, or moldings for houses and so on. Uh, because the tidal reach, the tidal range here is probably not as great as at Boston Harbor, the smaller tasks would be done as opposed to sawing huge tree trunks or doing pulling you know, where you needed a lot of power to pound the wool. Here you could do light work uh, even with a, a lower tidal range. Uh, and then there was a mill here in West Medford, um, sort of had a bulge there in the, the river, but um, one of the things to note is it's just below this is High Street in Medford. We're going to see that again. And just below there, we have this old mill that was excavated around uh, 1910. They'd found evidence of that mill at that time. Uh, of course, they were ex excavating for new developments. They, they weren't trying to find the archaeological remains. So West Cambridge became Arlington. And our Arlington mill was the Woods Mill. And it is right there. Again, just below High Street, as we saw on the Medford side, and uh, Medford Street on the Arlington side of the river. These are deed plans, and so Woods bought the lots in Arlington on this side of the river and put in his dam and then bought, oops, go back again, bought the lot on the Medford side of the river as well. So he has his dam there connecting both sides. and and the mill on the Arlington side. This is a picture of that mill building, which is long gone. Uh, 
Uh, we did make children's carriages, which we would call doll carriages today. And so that was a lighter form of industry than heavy mill work. <coughs> This is an example of the kind of thing he was producing. This isn't his uh, illustration. Now, uh, Richard Duffy put out a, uh, the Tinker Tidemill novel re yeah, as a facsimile reprint and then added a huge section of notes at the back. And so a lot of this information has come from Duffy's appendix to that reissued Tinker Mill novel. And that novel, uh, covered the issues of what happens when recreational uses of a river or fishing uses and so on collide with a dam's need for the use of the river. And, um, you know, do you get rid of the dam? Do you, <laughs> do you allow boats to pass? How do you do that uh, while maintaining everyone's interests? Of course, there were altercations in the novel. But the, it was built, the novel was built around the woods mill here in Arlington. So the, the author used this as his example. When we get to Charlestown, we have three locations known. And um, the one up here is called the Tufts Mill at that time. Uh, became, is now the John J. Ryan Jr. Playground, I believe, was just the originally the Charlestown Playground. <coughs> it was around the turn of the 20th century that it was filled in, finally. The one out here I didn't know nothing about, and so we're going to have to continue trying to research that one. <coughs> the one here was very early, in the 17th century, and um, it, 1803, I think, is when the Middlesex Canal Corporation bought that property. The mill continued until at least the 1850s, but they used that as their terminus for the Boston area. And then from there, they could have their canal boats uh, taken to Boston by cable. So there was a cable lying on the underside of the Charles River, and then they could winch that cable onto the canal boat and just pull themselves across and sort of complete that journey of the, the full canal uh, experience. And here, those are the three locations, as well as I can represent them today, but fully covered over, developed no evidence anymore of what's there. In Boston, uh, we, if you've been to lots of other historic talks for Boston, you've probably seen a lot of this information. But Mill Cove, in, between the north and west ends, had a, a tide mill area, so they used that. Marshy Cove, <coughs> from the early 17th century, to create a mill pond. And of course, you see there was a piece of land here, like a a barrier island almost here, and then they just created a causeway to it and across it so that <coughs> they could dam up either end and have water in the mill pond. And they also had this little break in the in the coastline there that they enlarged and called Mill Creek. It wasn't a creek, but anyway, it was a, another way for water to go in and out so that they could create dams at that point, that point, and that point. And so you see mills here in 1640. This is obviously a, a reproduction, or a reconstitution of what it would have looked like. And you see the, a tide mill here at the south mill location, so-called, and then one here at the north mill location. But that 1693 map we saw a few minutes ago <coughs> um, has a legend that says <coughs> P and Q. So two moulins and trois moulins. So P is here at the south mill location. And Q is here at the north mill. 1743, we see that there's a mill at the other end of that causeway. And of course, that causeway became Causeway Street. So uh, the Boston Garden is essentially on top of part of that now. The only remnant we have is from the, the dig, for the, the big dig, and we have a millstone on the street with no historic interpretation, as far as I can see. <laughs> <laughs> Someday when you go by there, you'll know why it's there. 
So now we go to the back bay, and if you've been to any of those talks about the filling of the back bay, you've heard some of this before. But uh, the creation of this long dam here was the important first piece. So from Beacon Hill out to Sewell's Point, then part of Brookline, but now Kenmore Square, uh, they created this long, mile and a half long dam, which became Beacon Street. Um, and then there's a, a cross dam here. So this was designed to have perpetual power. So when the tide is high, the receiving the uh, full basin, so-called, here could be filled. And you could do what you would with the, the receiving basin, but you'd probably just keep it closed so there's no water in the receiving basin. So then when the tide goes out below the level of the receiving basin, you can use these mills to uh, use the water here to power the mills along the cross dam. And the water just goes into this large area until the next low tide when it can be emptied. So it's got enough area to, to keep going while the tide is high on the outside of the dam. Fantastic proposal by Uriah Cotting to create the dam, to, uh, which would cost $250,000 apparently at the time, uh, but projecting $520,000 per year of annual income from the, something like 81 mills that you could power into this operation. It's a dismal failure. <laughs> this is uh, Nancy Cecil's recreation of how Beacon Street was built. Um, another illustration of the receiving basin and the full basin. Uh, let's see, this, even though this street doesn't go out to Beacon Street any longer, or this, this, this dam, the cross dam doesn't reach there, the, uh, there's no roadway or anything. This is about where Massachusetts Avenue crosses <coughs> the Beacon Street. To give you a sense of perspective, not quite out as far as Kenmore Square. Here you can just see a little bit of that receiving basin at the bottom of the illustration. So we see Boston Garden, Boston Common beyond, and we see on the left a little of Beacon Street as it's beginning to grow, but that left Beacon Street is the dam for the receiving basin. So we can see it was swampy. So when it didn't provide enough power, this scheme, and the swampy area collected lots of um, household waste, shall we call it, <laughs> <laughs> over time, uh, the uh, place became noxious and large enough, so awful enough, so that some of the city documents referred to it as a cesspool and it was filled in in the late, mid to late 1800s by the end. You can just see a few of the mills here, just um, a cable factory, some mills. Uh, not a lot going on. There's I think, a mahogany mill down here. It could actually run. I'm not quite sure. That might have been just a river mill because uh, it doesn't have a pond beyond it. This is a photo of Beacon Street, and the receiving basin here, the cross dam there, two white buildings that were mills. Uh, this is about 1858, so just before the, the place was filled in, and uh, I think after that there was just one drug mill left for a few years, and that was the end of it. So we have another illustration. I love these illustrations. So now we move on to Dorchester. And we have four locations in Dorchester. So the first one is here at the bottom of the South Bay. So most of us today know the South Bay as a shopping center. But it once was a bay. And so the tide flowed in you know, around <coughs> South Boston in through the bay. And so it was still tidal down here at the bottom of the South Bay. Now, South Bay has shaped, changed shape many, many times. They dredged it, they filled it in, they dredged it, they filled it in. So uh, we never know quite where the limits of South Bay are. But um, here's that location right at the bottom of the South Bay, that little uh, cross bridge or whatever it's called in this illustration, the McIntyre map of 1852. That's approximately where the tide mill was. And, uh, 
Here we have one that's just between Savin Hill and Commercial Point in Dorchester. You can see that it's a big circle, but Glover's Tide Mill Pond. We think this was one of those, due to the very small size of the pond, we think it was probably for light work. Uh, and in fact, they made pumps, they made uh, other fancy wood products, so we don't think it was heavy industry. You can see that actually the pond is like more of a wharf area. <coughs> Our third one here, this is Commercial Point. This is where the gas tank sits today. So if you go along the highway, you'll see the colorful gas tank there. Uh, there used to be a waterway called Tinian Creek that went in here and all the way up nearly to Fields Corner. But this little symbol here is, is where the tide mill was. There's now a, a Massachusetts National Guard armory there. But all of that land has been filled in. It's quite flat. Uh, if you walked along it, it would just seem like, wow, I'm in a riverbed. <laughs> it's filled with playgrounds and, and other stuff finally gets down to a school. But um, this one is an ancient uh, second oldest tidal mill in Dorchester. The first one was the one at the South Bay. This one's in about 1645. Um, interesting thing, the second owner of the mill uh, died when he was drawn through the cogwheel and slain into pieces. So it was a dangerous profession, apparently, if you didn't take care. Now, we know it's a tide mill because of documents we have. This is a lease, and it says uh, the one quarter part of a grist mill, it being a tide mill. So they actually made the reference there, which was great. But this one mentioned something that becomes to me like an irrational number. <laughs> <laughs> of another quarter of the mill. <laughs> I don't think it's possible, but anyway, maybe someone can fill me in later if they know what the solution to this is. So it represents how shares in families got divided, subdivided by their children, their grandchildren, and so on. And then, of course, the, the widow might get two portions for the rest of every, the children all get one portion out of that. And so you add them all together. And as they get passed down, it becomes very complicated. Unlike land, I mean, generally land resolves itself after a few generations. If someone, you know, the, the other siblings sell to one, so it all gets consolidated again. Tidal mills didn't seem to have that happen. They, and this is the operation of the mill, maybe, or just the building, as opposed to the surrounding land. Uh, so a different animal. And our last one is down here at the, the Possum River. And you can see there was a drug mill here, down near the bridge from Dorchester to Quincy. And you can see there's the mill pond. This is a 1930s photograph that shows the remnants of that, that pond and canal. Uh, so that's in the Ponset River Bridge in an earlier generation. It's now a huge <laughs> overarching <coughs> structure. The, um, so this is a, approximately where the, the Ponset Drive-In used to be. When we get to Quincy, we're going to skip all the way down to the Town River. Uh, there were four known tide mill sites in Quincy. This is one of them. It's, it's called the Souther Mill. There's an illustration of it. Um, the closer building to us is the, the grist mill portion. And then the building behind it is the lumber mill portion, uh, which no longer exists. So again, I have a photograph of that same view. But here's what we have left. Uh, too bad it's just the building without any kind of equipment inside. But again, we, we have a horizontal wheel there in the mud, which needs to be excavated archaeologically properly. So here we are at the end. And we don't have Revere and Quincy or Medford in this map, but this is a map of Boston. And, and the dark green is original land, and the lighter green from the gray is, is made land. So you can see that our sites have all been covered over by development, by making land for all of those needs from each generation <coughs> that it, it has uh, for new residences, commercial developments, playgrounds, highways, and so on. And 
This is just where we talk for a moment about why tide mills disappeared from the landscape. Well, all water mills, including river mills, of course, couldn't compete when steam and, and then later electricity came in as a source of power. And certainly, river mills were problematical because the, the river could freeze over. If a mill pond could freeze, you couldn't mill for certain. In the summer, it might go dry. Tide mills didn't usually freeze over because they're at the edge of the salt water and you can't mostly have salt water in them. But the schedule of operation was really weird. You know, you, you have you depend on the tide. So at the next tide, you have to wait for the tide to go down and then you can mill. Well, that happens once in the night and once during the day. And it also happens at like almost an hour different the next day. So, you know, you have a weird schedule. It's annoying at the very least. Um, so the regularity of steam and then electric power kind of uh, took over. Now, you could still use those powers in the same sites, but uh, tide mill buildings were not built for attractiveness. They were built for utilitarian uses. They essentially look like rectangles, most of them. And... Um, they didn't catch the popular imagination of history, historic preservationists early on. You know, historic preservation is a more modern kind of invention. And so at the early years, when people needed room for expansion for their new developments, uh, tide mills didn't seem to be something to be saved. All right. Only in Revere and Quincy, because I think the pressures of development didn't reach quite that far quite so soon. Have we two buildings that remain? And then when historic preservation became a great idea, the two buildings are now somewhat revered. That's why they exist. They were outside the urban core. Uh, it's the way of the world, I guess. And so I will leave you on that note. Uh, ask for any questions. Yes. Yeah. Uh, in the course of your research, and of course it would depend upon the size of the mill pond and the sluice way, but what would be like a good run time-wise for them to get a milling operation, like an hour, two hours? They could run for as much as six to seven hours on each tide. So the tide, when it ebbed, wouldn't have to completely clear the wheel area. Uh, you could use the force of the mill dam water that would overcome the, the backflow from the ebbing tide for light work. So after that, the tide has fully gone out, you could do more heavy work. So if you were going to saw tree trunks, you'd wait and, uh, or do the fulling on woolen cloth. You'd probably wait just that pounding. But light grinding for flour, uh, cocoa powder, um, various other things, snuff and spices could be done. Uh, when there was still some resistance on the wheel. Yeah. How were these operated as businesses? Were they, uh, oh, as spices obviously were for commercial, they were using for commercial sale. But were people, uh, farmers bringing this in and then the farmer would take the milk product and sell it? Or was, is so, it for personal use or? In the beginning, in the 17th century particularly, I know a little bit about, uh, there was, it was like a public concession to be able to build a mill. So then the obligation was to grind corn for anyone who grew corn in that town. And there was a miller's toll, so-called, either one-eighth or one-sixteenth of the product that was milled out. And so you would give the bulk of the flour back to the farmer. And then that could be used within town or sold or whatever. So... Uh, later on, I, I believe that the mill operators did, some of them, become big businesses. They were selling off the flour and uh, paying the farmers for their grain. So have you found any accounts of um, what it was like to operate the early mills um, in the 1700s? No real accounts from that period. Um, I don't think it changed much, though. <laughs> from then through the 19th century. Uh, Henry Nichols Blake 
Keith's father was a part owner in the, um, the Tileston Mill at Dorchester, and I'll just read to you a little bit of what he said. He was born in the mid-19th century. Uh, I was born in a one-story building on the southwestern side of Mill Street in Dorchester. On the opposite side of the street was a grist mill of the old style, owned by Ebenezer Tileston and my father. It was an ancient privilege. It went back to the 17th century and so on. My father was the miller and worked in the night or daytime according to the ebb and flow of the tide. The payment for grinding corn and grain was fixed by law, and the miller had the right to take for his services a certain portion of each grist called toll. But sometimes the parties agreed upon a sum of money instead. But we don't have a lot of documentation, that's for sure. Yes. That particular mill that you're speaking about by Tileston was not a paper mill? No. The paper and mill was another paper mill that was on the Ponset River? Right. So that was a later, a later Tileston family member and the one that where that part of Dorchester became part of Hyde Park, yeah. Fabulous, thank you. I live on Tilesboro Street, which used to be Tileston Street. Right, yeah. I've been to the Quincy site, and I thought the city of Quincy was going to renovate that. that well, passed. the city of Quincy owns it. Yeah. But there's a Friends of the Mill group that is essentially trying to raise money for it. The, they have obtained grants from the Community Preservation Act, Quincy's not particularly fast, let's say, <laughs> um, working on city-owned property. So the money's set aside. It's there. But you have to get all of those agencies within the city of Quincy together to approve a development plan. And you know, they've had these plans created. It, the friends have paid um, researchers to come out with, with uh, historic research and then a preservation plan and so on. But it doesn't get carried through to the to the next step, and so I believe there's still a pot of money there for things like the roof or putting in electricity or those <laughs> activities that need to be done before you can allow the public to go inside. Even though well, it's once in a while you can get inside. Did you show a picture of the Quincy Mills horizontal shaft? Is that I did. It was in the mud, right? It's still there. It was as of the time of the recent. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Do you happen to know if there was a mill on the Four River in Weymouth? I don't, but it's a good spot to look into. Yeah, because it's called Mill Cove, so I'm right. figuring that had to have been. I think probably so, but I, I can't tell you for sure. Uh, you know, I think that South Coast is probably a place that's ripe for ripe for uh, investigation. Is and I think the Taunton River too, that leads down toward Rhode Island, is. It was tidal, so uh, it's a good place for investigation. That's why someone is maybe not me. Any 21st century interests in? Um... Well, the interest in tides now is mostly in the use of tidal power for generating electricity. And so what has been going on in the last 50 years, there's a tidal barrage in France, which is built on a dam. I don't know, 10 or 15 or 20 turbines that get turned by both the incoming and outgoing tides. But more recently, the, the, it seems to be in favor, the idea is in favor of in-stream tide, no, tide production, tide energy production. So putting something on the riverbed uh, that probably doesn't interfere with traffic along the river, but a kind of turbine, and some of them are helical, some of them have like windmill kind of contraptions. And they're tethered on the bottom of the river, and as the tide goes in and out, it can power these turbines. Uh, Bay of Fundy is a place where this is being done just because the tidal rains there is like 28 feet. So, so in Boston, it's about 9 to 10 feet. So it just it, the Bay of Fundy is, is one of those places. You probably shouldn't start there, but they did. One of the reasons you shouldn't start there is because the, the weather is so extreme. And the tides are so extreme, and so you're dealing with the worst before you get, you can be <coughs> successful with just the normal. Um, Scotland and some other, uh, Japan, I think, are doing funded research into experimental projects, and they're hoping that they become uh, viable for commercial use. Yes. Is the reason 
the titles where your undershot or horizontal wheels to extend the amount of time. In right, I think you've only got that title range to work with when you're on the coast. And so you need to have a wheel where the water can be put down low, right. generally. I think there's more, I don't know what that, resistance perhaps when you put the water over the top. But I, no engineer <laughs> here. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah. Uh, on the tin can, so, about how many people did the largest Iowa Miller flight? Do you have any idea, like slaves?